This is going to be a controversial video. I'm about to challenge some widely accepted wisdom. If you were to ask me about polyfill three, four months ago, I would have told you definitely use it, especially if you've got a small sealed enclosure. I would have told you a big long story about an isothermal process where the vibrating pillow stuffing generated heat and that would change the density of the air inside of your enclosure. Then I would have pointed to you to some really good videos proving how the polyfill fill will actually change the properties of a sealed enclosure. And we'll talk more about those videos in just a little bit. Then I made a video showing how the size of an enclosure will impact the performance of a sealed subwoofer. And hey, no surprise, a lot of people mentioned polyfill. Since I already had these enclosures built and I had some polyfill on hand, I figured why not do a little bit of testing and show you exactly how polyfill makes a subwoofer enclosure better. The test setup consists of a calibrated measurement microphone, a laptop running Room Equalization Wizard, people abbreviate it RU or R-E-W, a subwoofer in an enclosure and a small amplifier. I also pulled out my DATs in order to take a few additional measurements. I'll give you links to all of the test equipment down in the video description. Now the process is pretty straightforward. It's really just kind of repetitive. It's just a matter of installing the subwoofer, running a couple of sweeps, pulling the driver out, putting some polyfill in, putting the driver back in, reinstalling the subwoofer and running another sweep, and then repeating that until I've collected all the measurement data that I want or need to collect. To weigh out the polyfill, I'm just using a food scale that I grabbed from the kitchen. My goal is to increase this in two ounce increments. The first batch actually ended up 2.1 ounces. It was kind of hard to break the polyfill up to get exactly two ounces. I also learned that if you're using one of these food scales, they don't work very well on carpet. So I had to move it to a nearby table in order to weigh it out for the test. The generally accepted rule of thumb is that you're supposed to use one pound or 16 ounces of polyfill per cubic foot of airspace. For this first enclosure it's 0.4 cubic feet so the theoretically optimal amount should be 6.4 ounces so as we add polyfill the resonant frequency should go down and the system should have more low-end extension up until we hit 6.4 ounces and then adding more polyfill on top of that will make the box behave as if it's smaller so let's go ahead and put the first bit of polyfill in as you can see 2.1 ounces is quite a lot of polyfill to put in this small enclosure now I opened this video by saying that polyfill doesn't work and I want to show you exactly what I mean by that. So I ran a bunch of sweeps in Room EQ Wizard and then took that data and exported it so that I can bring it into Microsoft Excel and make some plots for you that are easier to see than what you get from Room EQ Wizard. Right here on the screen is the difference between an empty 0.4 cubic foot enclosure and the same enclosure with 2.1 ounces of polyfill. And the result is actually pretty close to what we would expect. When an enclosure gets larger you get less of the high-end output. A small enclosure will give you a bump in those higher frequencies. And by higher frequencies here, we're talking about <laughs> around 80 hertz. And in exchange for that, you should get more low-end extension. And as you can see here, that's not exactly what happens. You just lose output at all possible frequencies. And more importantly, it's not actually a very big drop in output. At around 80 hertz where the decrease is largest, you're looking at about 0.7 decibels and you're not gonna be able to hear that difference. A one dB change in volume is the smallest change in volume that a typical human being can hear. That is literally the definition of a decibel. So unless you like have a golden ear or something, you're not gonna hear a 0.7 dB change. Adding 2.1 ounces of polyfill to this enclosure absolutely did not improve the sound. Let's add two more ounces. This chart is showing the difference between empty and 4.1 ounces. And the result is pretty much the same until you get down to the very low frequencies. At 26 hertz, the two lines cross each other, and now the stuffed box is outperforming the empty box. But again, by a very minute amount. So you do get extra low end extension, but not enough to really justify wasting your time and money putting polyfill in the enclosure. We see the same pattern when we bump up to 6.1 ounces of polyfill. Fill. Now notice just how full the box is when you put 6.1 ounces of polyfill in it. That's a whole lot of polyfill and it's going to be a bit of a challenge to get the stuff into the enclosure. Now this is really close to our theoretical optimum 6.4 ounces and at 
this point, we should start to see the benefit of using the polyfill. Now the pattern continues and that pattern is very little audible difference. Now I want to be really clear here. It's quite obvious that the polyfill is doing something. By adding the stuffing to the box, it is behaving as if you made the box bigger. You're losing some output on the upper end. You're gaining some low end extension. We can really see that at 6.1 ounces of polyfill. The issue of course, is that the difference is not going to be very audible. Now let's add even more polyfill. And as you can see, it really is a challenge to cram 8.1 ounces of pillow stuffing into this subwoofer box. And this time we see an actual interesting change. You will have an audible difference in those very low frequencies. Even though I would have expected to have gotten an even worse result by putting this much in there, it's actually probably the, the best amount. The two lines here cross at about 45 Hertz and you really do get more low end extension. Probably not really audible except at the lowest levels, but that's the goal. The goal is to get that low end extension. Now what I'd like to do is use my DATS to take some measurements and show you those results. And I did that, but somehow when I was transferring files from one computer to another, I could not find the DATS results for the 0.4 cubic foot box. But I do have those results for the next size up box. I've got a 0.65 cubic foot box. You know, all this test equipment, it is not cheap. And the only reason why I'm able to afford these kinds of tools is because of the support of viewers like you. And I want to say thank you to everyone who joined me on Patreon. My $10 patrons are scrolling above the screen right here. And I always want to give a special shout out to my $25 patrons, Bo, David T, Doug, Dylan, Baba, and Stereolab LLC. Thank you guys, I appreciate you all so much. Where did these boxes come from? I made these boxes for this video right here. So if you wanna check that video out and see what I was doing with those boxes, click right there. And I plotted those DATS results in Excel. And what you can see is that as you add more stuffing, the FS, that is the resonant frequency of the system went down, which is why we use polyfill in the first place. You get the same result that you get when you make a larger enclosure. In addition to that, there's this parameter known as the Q. Right here, we can see that as we add more polyfill, the Q also gets lower. So in that sense, adding more polyfill to the enclosure does indeed work. It does have an impact on the performance of the driver. If you jump on YouTube, there are two really good videos showing this. One of them is on the Toyd's DIY channel. Uh, Toyd and I, we do a live stream every Monday night at 7.30. Make sure you catch us. And he's got a great video showing how this changes when you add polyfill to an enclosure. I'll make sure and give you a link to it down in the video description. And there's a great video by Steve Mead where he uses one of his test devices in order to show the exact same thing. Adding more polyfill makes the enclosure act as if it is a bigger enclosure. So it does work as if you're making the box bigger. But one thing to remember about sealed enclosures is they're very forgiving. We often recommend that people who are new to box building start off with sealed enclosures because it's just harder to mess it up. So it stands to reason that using polyfill to change the effective size of the enclosure will also have very small impacts. And that is the issue here. And here's a chart showing just that. I started with no fill and then went up by two ounce increments up to 10 ounces. And what you'll notice is that adding polyfill always lowered the output at higher frequencies and it almost never actually improved the low end extension. And my results are wildly inconsistent. The absolute worst performance came from putting four ounces into this 0.65 cubic foot enclosure. And the theoretically optimum amount should be somewhere around 10 ounces. And the 10 ounce line also has less output at every frequency. In fact, the eight ounce line decreased the SPL very little and did more for low end extension, the two blue lines. Now, before we wrap things up and conclude beyond a shadow of a doubt that polyfill is a terrible idea, there's a couple of things that we need to talk about. The first thing we need to talk about is the room effect. And if you're putting it in a car, that's called cabin gain. The environment the subwoofer is in will impact the performance of the subwoofer. And several people commented that you could get around this lack of low frequency extension by just putting in a car and letting the cabin gain do the trick. And that's not really relevant because you could do the same thing with a ported enclosure. And then the low wind extension that the ported enclosure already has would benefit from the cabin gain. The goal when making these kind of comparisons is to control for the environment so that the only thing that changes between tests is the thing that you're actually testing. In this case, 
changing out the polyfill. The carpet on the floor is another example. It will impact the output, but all of these subwoofers were tested in the exact same spot, same distance from the mic. I put tape down on the floor and they all had the exact same negative impact from the carpet. So we have a controlled environment. A lot of people commented that you could just simply use the Linkwince transform. Well, what the heck is that? That's just using an equalizer or a crossover or a DSP in order to either cut the higher frequencies or boost the lower frequencies. And the sound quality people will argue that that's the best possible sound quality. But I'm not testing the impact of an equalizer. I'm testing the impact of using polyfill. So the question is always, can you put polyfill in a smaller enclosure to make it sound like it's a larger enclosure? So what we have here is the 0.65 cubic foot enclosure with a few different levels of stuffing compared to a 0.88 cubic foot enclosure. That is the black line. And here's what you see. The smaller enclosure is louder no matter the amount of stuffing you put in it at those upper frequencies. That's the bump you should expect when you have a smaller enclosure. And then if you look at the very low frequencies, you see the black line there, the larger box has more low frequency extension. So maybe you can put polyfill in a small box and make it perform like a large box, but I was not able to find the point where that happens. The differences are so small that they could be attributed entirely to measurement error. Measurement error is the type of random error that's just a normal part of any measurement process. The way to fix measurement error is to take repeated samples and then do some statistics, which is one of the many reasons why I joined Skillshare. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. I've been working my way through a course titled Getting Started with R Statistical Software by Dr. Lyndon Walker. In that class, he explains the process and how to do statistical tests in R. The process would require repeating the sweeps about 30 times and then averaging the results before adding polyfill and then repeating again for the next quantity of polyfill. That will give you the data that you need to perform a t-test or possibly an f-test or even a linear regression using R. This statistical hypothesis test can then be used to determine if the results I've shown you were due to randomness or if they were a real valid result. So if you're interested in making a career pivot or leveling up your skills in your current role, Skillshare is a great resource. It's also a great resource for freelancers and entrepreneurs. Check the video description for a link to Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. And this is the way most science is conducted. It's time consuming. I suspect that if I were to go through all that, I would get the same results that I got this time. But I'll cut you a deal. If this video can hit a quarter million views in two months time, I'll go through the trouble to set that test up and do all that for you. And in the meantime, I'd like to issue a challenge. If you have a social media presence and you have access to test equipment, I challenge you to dig your test equipment out and make those tests on your own. Now, I'm sure some of you are gonna drop some links in the comments pointing out some other people that have made similar tests and have reached a different conclusion. I know how to Google. I found most of those. None of them convinced me. That's why I did my own test. I'm inviting you to do your own testing and prove me wrong because I would really like to be wrong because I would like to be able to look right at that camera and tell you that $10 worth of pillow stuffing from Walmart will fix all your problems. And there are a lot of different ways you could test this out. I didn't do an AB listening test, for example. I don't have access to a clipple. I didn't do an in-car SPL test. Now, I recently picked up an SPL meter, and if there's a lot of interest in this topic, I might try some SPL testing in a car. Now, if you want to see this meter in action, click on this video right here. My name is Justin. This is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel. To subscribe, click right here, and I will see you on the next adventure.